Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Adherent First and 15. This is a season finale. We have, I mean, I'm proud to have uh, as our final guest, uh, Maestro Paolo Castelnuovo from Varese. Good morning, Maestro. Hey, good morning to everybody, and thank you for inviting me. Today, the topic of the Maestro is uh, the synonasal malignancies of anterior skull base, a histology drive and treatment strategies. So I do keep remind to all the attendees from all around the world to ask the questions at the end of the talk. I leave the torch to the professor. Thank you. First of all, I give you the greetings from our university. Borese is a small city of North Italy, very close to the Alps and to the border of Switzerland. And things from Italian Scout Base Society, from Italian Academy of Rhinology, and from our Scout Base Department. And uh, I joined this department with uh, Professor Davide Locatelli. Uh, the first issue is that the oncological principles are the same for every kind of treatment you are, you are organizing. So the optimal treatment is when you consider the tumor's biology, the histotype, the grading, and the tumor extension in the patient profile. And for a sinonasal malignant tumor, we have a big issue relating to the high number of different pathologies we encounter. Uh, this makes very difficult to make statistics. It's very difficult to try to choose the right uh, treatment. So we try to stratify this uh, high number of different uh, pathology in three main groups the high-grade tumors, the intermediate-grade tumors, and the low-grade tumors. Then we have to consider the extension of the cancer and the patient profile, age, comorbidities, and precluding. And all these different parameters we have to consider in the tumor board. So in our department, no one patient proceeds to the every kind of treatment without us through the tumor board. And I mean that the tumor board is a compound by the otolaryngologist, neurosurgeon, pathologist, anesthesiologist, radiation oncologist, occupational medicine, because the high number of um, this kind of tumors is related to occupational medicine. And uh, uh, we uh, very, very frequently, more or less in all the cases, ask for a second opinion of histology. And the second opinion we send in a center with a dedicated expertise to confirm the histotopic, to understand the grade of differentiation for planning a correct therapeutic strategy. So the second opinion and the to have a very deep knowledge in the different isotype is the basic concept to start to discuss in the tumor board to analysis the case, the patient profile, and, uh, and to decide which kind of therapy we have to uh, put in our program. So we can choose between radiotherapy, surgery, chemo, or the new biologic therapy to have the best result, long-term result, and the best quality of the life. As a surgeon, we always have to understand that surgery in those tumors are not always the best treatment option. We have to consider the histopathologic evolution and the new kind of different the kind of pathology <clears throat> like the uh, smart RCB, INI, one that is carcinoma, that are very poor prognosis uh, kind of tumor. And we have to add this uh, new kind of tumor in our patient. Uh, so, regarding the uh, histology driven uh, treatment, we have to consider that in high-grade tumors, and I mean 
SNAC, SNAC, G3, squamous carcinoma, Ewing sarcoma, in all these kind of tumors, we never start with surgery. We do chemo first and chemo radiation, and then the surgery only for recurrence. So in those tumor, we have to consider the uh, biology of this tumor, the aggressivity of this tumor, and they are not surgical entities. So this is a, a example of what I mean. This is a case of a young lady, and the biology was uh, olfactor neuroblastoma, EMS type 3. So the um, surgery, the treatment can be with chemo, craniofascial resection, or chemo radiation. Of course, we move first for revision histology. Uh, Olfactor neuroblastoma type 3 require a surgical procedure, but we move first for revision histology and for the second opinion, the use all the new markers. And uh, the final result of the revision histology was poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. So in is we never move for surgery first. So we make induction chemo uh, with cisplatin plus heptozid, and uh, we consider we will consider the outcome of the first uh, three, four uh, round of treatment, and uh, if the response, if the reaction of the tumor mass of the tumor volume is more than 80 percent we move for chemo radiation exclusively and uh, this was the case of the lady three months after the beginning of the treatment and uh, so we never do surgery in this case but we move for chemo radiation exclusively and this is the result one year after treatment now it's already three years in this lady and uh, uh, she is free of disease so for the poorly differentiated tumors we have induction chemo at least three codes of induction chemo then with magnetic resonance we evaluated the reduction of the tumor and if the reduction is more than 80 percent we move for chemo radiation exclusively if there's a good result but less than 80 percent we put surgery and then adjuvant radio radiation it's another uh, example of uh, this kind of a uh, tumor. This is the uh, uh, snack, and uh, the biopsy. You can appreciate the extension of the tumor in uh, the anterior skull base in the orbit, but still there is a plane between the fat and the muscle. And this is was after four course for cycles of chemo of chemo and this was the surgery we did and the resection of the septum superiostale resection so we find for the superiostale plane and we make a resection of the tumor not this meal, but with a centripetal resection, taking the superior cell plane from the lacrimal pathways to the sphenoid, performing a draft type 3 frontal sinus floor, floor removal. 
and then we put in the center and resect the the tumor and then we move for medial maxillectomy and the resection of the cartilage and the osseous septum and then open the skull base make a good resection of the pleural space and make the resection of the dura, the resection bulb, and then the reconstruction with the three layer of two layer of rashavata intradural, then the second layer extradural in the epidural space. You see the meticulous position. We put some fat, and then finally we use the contural mucoperiosteum of the septum to make the final reconstruction of the skull base. So it was a flip flat, and this was undifferentiated tumor, undifferentiated carcinoma, and we did we do perform in this patient a three modal treatment means induction chemo, then surgery, then adjuvant radiation. For the other two groups, intermediate grade tumors and low grade tumors, we move first with the surgery, surgical treatment, and then adjuvant radio radiation. And this is for adenoid squamous cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma of factor in blastoma. And in all these cases, the principle are to get the free margin resection. Always when we program a surgical treatment, our target, our goal, is to reach the free margin resection. It's not a problem, unblocked resection. We don't look for to get unblocked resection, but we use disassembling. That means we resect the tumor and then we uh, put the, all the different part again to reconstruct and to send the pathologist a uh, scheme of three-dimensional scheme of the tumor so it's a disassembling and uh, this was the, the surgical treatment of the paranasal tumor in the past the very important the keystone point was the resection the craniofascial resection introduced by kitchen in the 60s then in the 90s we start to approach indonesia the resection of these tumors but to do that we learn how to repair first the skull base defect and moving with the indonesia endoscopic experience we were able to approach all the three cranial fossa through the nose or the ventral skull base and uh, once again the key point was always the achievement of the free margin resection which is the present we have four different main approach for this tumor the endonasal resection the endonasal resection with the craniectomy the cranial endoscopic resection and the cranial fascial resection. So, in your team, has to be all the skillness to approach these different uh, surgical approaches. There is no any competition between the different endonasal or external approach or combined approach there is only different indication. And uh, the, the goal, the target, always the achievement of the free 
margin resection. This was our experience. We we'll start in the early 90s resecting the T1 tumor and then move to reach the T4B tumor in uh, some years later. And still there is the criteria for the scalp, the endonasal exclusion criteria. So when there is involvement of the frontal sinus, involvement of the brain parenchyma, of the eye content, of the lateral wall of maxillary sinus on the floor of the nose. In all these cases, we are not able to reach the free margin resection through an endonasal procedure. So, of course, we need to move to craniofacial resection. Also, in this case, it's very different. If there is a spreading, along the roof of the orbit and I cannot reach the free margin resection, I need a cranial endoscopic resection. Nowadays, with the multiportal approaches, we can approach this kind of tumor through a combination to the superior edit approach. But in this case, we are able to reach the boundaries of the tumor to endonasal approach so we can proceed, but you have to consider if there is a, a division line between arachnoid and the tumor. If there is brain infiltration, it's much better to move to cranial endoscopic resection. So we still have many surgical approach considering cranial fascial resection. Once again, no any competition between the different techniques, different indication. How to get the decision of which kind of surgical approach? We need a very high quality magnetic resonance that gives us the morphology of the tension of the tumor and the relationship between the border of the tumor and the dura and the parenchyma or the border of the dura in the period orbit and the orbital fat and muscle. So we need a high quality in the in investigation with the high quality magnetic resonance to understand the still there is a CSF interface. When there is edema around the lesion, we know that there is a brain invasion. So we need to move for a craniofascial approach or at least a cranioendoscopic approach. So once again, CT scan is not enough. CT scan does not give us a very good uh, analysis of the uh, relationship between the border of the tumor and dura parenchyma orbit period. So during the surgery, we need to have many sample frozen section, frozen section to understand if we still are in free marginal section. For this reason, the pathology is with us for all the time of the surgery and uh, we send to the pathologist different uh, histotype to understand the border of the lesion and then we put the uh, the specimen of the tumor on wood and we mark the different uh, side of the tumor to let understand the pathologist the orientation of the tumor itself because it's mandatory to have this kind of information to have a condivision this information with the pathology. We have just seen before cutting the folds we always make a regulation of the inferior portion of the folds not to have bleeding 
from the sagittal sinus. Then we use cotonoid to divide the parenchyma and the arachnoid to preserve the bleeding. Okay, and so, so in the OR, the setting of the different uh, uh, techniques is different. We can we can use the four hands to nostril techniques for all the lasting of the surgery, and we can have different fa uh, setting facing each other, the two surgeons, or staying on the uh, same side of the patient. And this can be uh, changed during the surgery related to the anatomy and to the extension of the surgery. But the key point is that this surgery is not like a fest, it is not like a random resection of the tumor. The concept is that is a tumor disassembling. So it's a surgery drives by anatomy, and the different steps are tumor debulking, then removal of the septum, then draft type three the resection of the floor of the frontal sinus to have the right perception of the anterior skull base. And then removal of the bone. Then before opening the dura, it's mandatory to make a large dissection of the epidural space above the roof of the orbit. Anterior cranial fossa is really different comparing the middle and the posterior cranial fossa. We don't have any vital structures above the roof of the orbit. So we can make a very large dissection of the dura. This is paramount important for the skull base reconstruction because in this Poach we have created, we insert the second layer of the uh, fascia for the skull base reconstruction. Then we make removal of the dura of the olfactory bulb of the uh, tumor that is thread in the cranium, and then we make the skull base reconstruction. So the pathology has to be with you. The intraoperative frozen section we take on the surgical field on the border of the dura resection and we send the specimen to the pathologist with an orientation and we told the pathologist the different side anterior, posterior, lateral of the uh, surgical specimen. Uh, this is an example of the resection. We are now on the roof of the right ethmoid, and we make the coagulation and resection of the anterior ethmoidal artery and the posterior ethmoidal artery. Because we do not this, we cannot dissect the dura, and we do bilaterally. Now we move for the resection of the bone from one orbit to the other. And then a key point is the resection of the crystal gallery. Because after the resection of the crystal gallery, you can dissect the dura from the posterior wall of the frontal sinus. So we can, you can create a poach. This is, okay, this is paramount important because this is where you put the anchorage of your second layer, you see, very large dissection. Only after this dissection of the dura in the epidural space, you can move for the opening of the dura, then we clip or we make bipolar coagulation of the folks and we make the bilateral resection. You have seen the first vessel you encounter is the MOFA, 
So it means medial frontal orbital artery. And you have never to damage this artery, not to have a complication with the frontal lobe. Again, bipolar regulation and then resection of the fork, resection of the olfactory bulb, this is bilateral anterior scal base resection for olfactory neuroblastoma. So we remove also the olfactory bulb. And then we are able to resect the anterior case. And this is uh, we, with the ethmoid and with the skull base in one block. And you see the olfactory bulb on the top. The dura. Okay, ethmoidal turbinate bilateral. So, content of the ethmoid, and you see the resection now start the reconstruction, and uh, the success of the skull base uh, procedure is to the ability to repair the dural defect. We never start in the 90s the resection of tumor of arterial skull base. Since we reached a very well validated techniques for the reconstruction. So in your personal uh, surgical, uh, surgical evolution, you have first to learn how to make the reconstruction. Uh, only in when in your hands there is a very well validated technique, you are able to move for the resection, never before. And we have different techniques using graft, free graft, this is iliotibial tract, fasciolata, or pericle flaps, or flaps with vascular reconstruction. And this is related to the pathology, to the site, and to the biology of the lesion. Uh, with the free flap, we have Haddad flap, sorry, free flap. With the pedicle flap, we have Haddad flap, we have uh, the flip flap in the monolar, monolateral resection, we have the mailbox in the pericranial flap, or we have temporal parietal flap. But we always like to use autologous material. So our first choice is fasciolata, and we like to take the iliotibial tract that is a little bit more uh, inferior and lateral and is thicker. So it's easier to manage, and we do perform three layers. The first one is 30% uh, uh, bigger than the dural defect. The second one is inserted in the pouch you have created before opening the dura. When I told you that we need to make a large dissection over the roof of the orbit, we need the resection of the crystal galley to make the section of the posterior wall of frontal sinus to make the anchorage. And the third layer, it's only to for protection of the first two. In three months, if you use fascia, this third layer will necrotize. The different choice of the different uh, techniques of closure is mainly related to the biology of the tumor and to the extension of the tumor. In the majority of our cases, this tumor involved are extended to the nasal septum. So it's very rare we use pedicle local flap like Haddad or flip flap. We need the 
three layer of fascial lata always when the septum is involved and this is for oncological reason and this is are the first layer of uh, fascial lata iliotibial tract i told you 30 percent bigger than the dural defect and then uh, the second layer will be inserted in the epidural phase. So this is uh, the space between the bone and the dura. And this is the water tie reconstruction. And then this is the third layer, only to protect the first two layers. And when we do perform this closure, first layer percent bigger than the dural defect second layer inserted in the epidural pouch in the epidural phase third layer then we use some drop of fat for to close the hidden space to close the empty space and then the third layer to protect and to cover if you have well dissected the, the, the dura, if there is a brain retraction, there is a space between the graft and the dura, you can push the dura in contact with the graft. And then you can glue. And if there is still some empty space, you can put the fat. Fat is a totally potent with the stem cell so it's very well integrated this is all material that are biologically uh, uh, proposed for the in well integration for a right integration and you see you can put some drop of fat to close the empty space you move for the final third layer and usually we don't use balloon to support this kind of closure because the two layer the two first layer are already able to make a water tie closure it's like a sandwich and this is the flip flap when the lesion is monolateral and there is no brain invasion. We can use as a third layer the contralateral septum. And in this case, the healing is much faster. We never have crust for two, three months, like we have in, uh, with the third layer with the uh, fascia, because fascia is not. Uh, designed for a contact with the ear. Mucoperiosteum is already able to be in contact with the air. So the reconstruction with the third layer of the mucoperiosteum is much faster for the healing. This is a case of a snack we have already so, and after the resection, this is the time of the third layer, first two layer with fascia, and now the third layer, you see, this is the contralateral mucoperiosteum and can cover very well the roof and then also the orbit. And at the end, we put these are reassorbable sponges. These are cell and then glue and we never use balloon we use only a narrow cell pack in the nose in the floor uh, not to leave the patient breathing the first day but we remove this packing in day one after surgery and this was the result of the the contralateral uh, olfactory fissure is free 
so you can preserve the contralateral olfaction. This is the flap, very well integrated, sphenoid sinus opening, frontal sinus opening, the maxillary sinus, and the orbit. So the flap, the flip flap, can cover the skull and also the orbit. So, but once again, the biology, the pathology drive, drives the uh, treatment. And for the uh, third uh, segment of this tumor for the uh, olfactory neuroblastoma is one of the third group tumors, so the low grade. But you see, we have to make a very well uh, differential diagnosis between olfactory neuroblastoma, neuroendocrine, and in between olfactory neuroblastoma, EMS grade make a very dramatic difference. Olfactory neuroblastoma, one, two, three EMS, is a surgical entity. So we start first with surgery and then adjunctive uh, radiation. But EMS4, it's completely different tumor. Still is a olfactory neuroblastoma, but is a completely different tumor. And the behavior of these tumors is very similar to the neuroendocrine. So in EMS4 or factory neuroblastoma, we never start with surgery. This is the reason we always move for a second opinion and we send the specimen in the very uh, skilled pathologist to have this second opinion. This was a, a joint case uh, we share with University of Brescia and the University of Bologna, and we consider a cases of 98 patients. You can observe the dramatic difference between olfactory neuroblastoma and the neuroendocrine carcinoma regarding the overall survival. And uh, in the olfactory neuroblastoma, it's dramatic to observe the difference in the overall survival between EMS 1, 2, 3, and EMS 4. So EMS 4 is a completely different tumor, and in EMS 4, we never move for surgery first, but for a chemo first, then surgery, then radiation, deep radiation. So the, the prognosis in this factor neuroblastoma and this tumor is the, the biological and the pathological different view, behavior between this tumor. And the, the irradiation in this tumor is not related only on the T, but we always irradiate also the neck and the retropharyngeal node. Similarly, we have to consider the differences mean between the adenocarcinoma group. Adenocarcinoma, in our case, is, is the larger. Uh, group of uh, tumor and a different uh, approach in T1, T2 stage, in T3, T4, always we make adjuvant radiotherapy and if there is a P53 mutation, we have, we move for induction, chemo. So we have to consider this uh, tumor and we have also to consider the behavior of this tumor with the multifocal uh, point of origin of this tumor. So there is a, a large discussion if uh, we have to perform always a bilateral or monolateral resection. Uh, now in the last 
10 years, our behavior is a, a little bit modified. So we now, nowadays we do perform monolateral resection only in a T1, T2 case, and we move for bilateral resection in T3, T4 cases. But once again, in between the intestinal type adenocarcinoma, you have to consider the different behavior in the different subtype of this tumor, papillary, colonic type, solid type, mucinous type. Look, in the mucinous type, signet ring cell, we have a zero of five year overall survival. Uh, 15 years ago, we were not able to understand why some of this intestinal type adenocarcinoma patient treated in the same way with the same protocol have a dramatic difference in the outcome. But we now know that this subtype, the secret ring cell, it's dramatically more aggressive regarding the other type. So in between the same tumor, adenocarcinoma, we have tumor with a low aggressivity and tumor with a very, very high aggressivity. So we know that the surgery is not enough. We always need adjuvant drug therapy. And in very selected case, we need uh, uh, indu uh, chemo. Again, tumor board is mandatory is the way we approach the treatment the treatment of this tumor not only in the decision of with the kind of uh, treatment we have to perform but also in the follow-up of this uh, tumor so the follow-up of this tumor he has to run by multidisciplinary team. We need very expert radiologists and uh, not in the, our group to understand if there is a local relapse, dual relapse, or if it is uh, a side effect, a complication of the radiation. For instance, in this patient, the, the follow-up with magnetic resonance show that was not a persistence of the lesion, not a, a intracranial metastasis, but was only radionecrosis. And this is, was a very important, paramount important to understand. So the follow-up, you cannot send for the follow-up this patient in a center with no experience in the, for the treatment of the tumor. And this is a, a very important topic. And of course, that means that the urster has to take care of this patient and the volume of the uh, post-op examination increase a lot. And we have to understand that if the magnetic resonance is mandatory for all the follow-up, we need to have integration with the a PET examination for have a coherence in the indication of the persistence of the lesion. So for the first group of very biologically aggressive tumor, for the follow-up, we need a combination integration between the uh, magnetic resonance and PET. This was a, a very a good experience we have in those 20 years and uh, we uh, unify our cases with the Professor Nicolai of Brescia in the, all the decision, uh, the philosophy of the group and uh, we treat uh, as, um, at least 80, 100 patients in these years and this was the, the group of patients of uh, Varese, 
And this was the division of the T stage and the histology. You will see that the main group is in inner type adenocarcinoma. That is 35% of the entire group. And uh, regarding the overall survival, you can clearly see how histology drives the final outcome, how sinonasal endocrine uh, tumor carcinoma, sinonasal endocrine carcinoma is the worst one, like melanoma. Olfactory neuroblastoma is the best result. Uh, in the middle, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. So histology, pathology drives the final outcome. Relating the surgery, the relating the extension of the tumor is significantly worse when we have dural involvement versus no dural involvement. Again, the histology drives the final outcome. What about the complication we have with the endonasal uh, procedure, endonasal surgery? We have no more complication than the standard craniofacial resection. The rate of major complication is quite uh, acceptable, is 8.8. .8. And if we look the the, the presence of the CSF leak comparing the different group of time, uh, it's related to the learning curve of the surgeon. When we started to do this surgery, we have a rate 9.4. Now is 1.6, so it's very low comparing the middle or posterior cranial fossa. And the analysis of the quality of life show that we have a restoration of the quality of life in one year post-op. And this is very important, very good. The variables associated with the worst quality of life are the age of the patient, adjuvant radiotherapy, the extension of the of the tumor in the intra uh, intradural extension and the uh, in morbidity of the surgery, the large surgery like nasal craniectomy. The future. The future means uh, for surgery multiportal approaches. Nowadays, with the endoscope, uh, with the combined surgical equip, we can move to endonasal and transcranial, the neurosurgeon to transcranial, in the same time, the endoscopic, endoscopist ENT to the nose, but we can move to the transorbital endonasal, to the transoral endonasal. So, Endoscopic is only a tool, and we can apply this tool with the different approaches to reach the target of the surgery that is free margin resection. But the future direction are the studies on molecular profile to help the predict prognosis of better tailor treatment. The biologic treatment with the biotherapy are already <clears throat> entered in the our armamentarium in the armamentarium of the tumor board and we have need uh, more confirmation of the different uh, protocol but the new uh, biotherapy is already started to uh, consider uh, this uh, additional uh, instrument we have for the treatment of this kind of tumor. So, in conclusion, we need to know 
the limits we have today as surgeon the first thing we have to consider and to know is when we have not to start with the surgery the treatment of this patient then we have to consider that say endoscopic is only a tool the different sur uh, surgical approach have no any competition but it's different indication and the final goal is to reach the free margin resection with reduction of the morbidity the histology as i show you drive the strategies so we need in the tumor board a very skilled uh, colleagues in the different field to have a correct diagnosis and with the correct diagnosis we can approach if we need medical treatment or surgery and in the surgery we have to know if we need the external or endonasal approach but all this decision is taken by the tumor board so the treatment uh, of the malignant tumor of the nose and sinus is a really multidisciplinary manner no way so i went to thank all the crew of Brescia and uh, Varese, of the crew of ENT, neurosurgeon, and all the tumor board. And finally, I want to invite you in our courses in Varese. We have skull based dissection courses in March and uh, basic in uh, November. I want to invite you in ERS in 2020 in Thessaloniki. In uh, 2020, in end of October, we will organize an international congress for Italian skull based society. And in June 23, 26, we organize a European skull based society in Italy, in the same place, Riva di Garda, well, the European uh, society uh, was born uh, more than 20 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maestro, for your brilliant presentation. Uh, you've been through all the different uh, analyses, uh, starting from uh, <clears throat> each histology and how to deal with that. So we will start with the questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, which camera regime for uh, uh, SNOOC? With which chemotherapy regime for a uh, snook? So, uh, I show you in uh, we the TPF for snook now, the, the protocol and uh, is TPF, and uh. So, so, so. So as uh, before you reach into that uh, uh, slides, uh, uh, there are uh, other questions that has been submitted. There are very, very lots of them. So in case we cannot deal with them due to lack of time, I do please all the attendees to uh, send any kind of inquiry to directly to Professor Castanuovo and attend his courses, which are essential for anyone that are approaching to such a, a, a surgery. Uh, this is the protocol cisplatin to etoposit. So, perfect. And Another... we do per we do perform at least three cores of this chemo, and then magnetic resonance to consider the uh, re reduction of the volume of the tumor. So we, we don't consider any uh, uh, two um, dimension parameter like the large of the high extension but we consider volume 
The reduction of the volume is the key point for take the decision to move for uh, exclusive chemo radio or surgery or trimodal, trimodal with the surgery. Another question from uh, Asia. The, our colleagues is asking, when are you suggesting proton therapy? So we, we did uh, a large study in Italy with the uh, proton and uh, uh, carbon ion therapy after uh, this uh, in the very aggressive tumor in the first group. And uh, we will have, uh, I think, uh, uh, now we have closed this large study uh, that was done with uh, the uh, Milan Institute of Tumor and the CNAO, that is center in the North Italy in Pavia, where uh, we have the main place for the proton and carbon ion therapy. Uh, we will uh, publish the result in, uh, I think, in uh, six months at least, because we are waiting for the final evaluation of the um, uh, of the uh, of the evaluation result, and uh, uh, so we uh, take uh, the uh, proton therapy and the uh, uh, carbon ion for first of all for the, the first group of aggressive tumors. And, uh, and then for the uh, recurrence of uh, this tumor. For instance, we do use uh, um, proton after, uh, in melanoma, after surgery, we use proton. In adenoid cystic carcinoma, we use proton. For the less aggressive tumor, like uh, uh, intestinal type adenocarcinoma or factor neuroblastoma, we still use uh, the modulated uh, MRT, IMRT approach. Another question from South America. Uh, are you performing complete uh, uh, anterior uh, craniectomy for pathologies involving the planum sphenoidale? Uh, so it's a uh, the concept uh, of the planum senedalis, I can uh, approach with the endonasal procedure if uh, the extension of the tumor allow me to make a free margin resection. Otherwise, we move for cranioendoscopic uh, procedure. Uh, the very critical point in the planum senedalis in this malignant tumor is the involvement of the uh, optic canal and the involvement of the cavernous sinus. And this became a situation in which uh, it's not surgical uh, extension of the tumor. And in fact, uh, one of the questions coming from the United States, uh, it's uh, something similar. The colleagues is asking the question, what if you have in doubt of cavernous sinus involvement? Are you performing embolization? Uh, so in very, very selected and rare case, we need to make uh, occlusion of the carotid, uh, the resection of the carotid. But usually, if the malignant tumor involves the cavernous sinus, uh, the discussion with the tumor board uh, run um, uh, the treatment for a combination between less aggressive surgery and then uh, uh, proton bean or carbon ion therapy. So in those cases, uh, we discuss with the radiologists if they need reduction of the volume of the tumor, but we do perform a gross total resection of the tumor. We leave the dura intact so we can proceed faster to the second step of the uh, treatment that is with the radiation therapy. So no surgery for malignant tumor involving the cavernous. 
Okay, we don't have enough, enough time. Unfortunately, this is the last question that we can provide and uh, it's coming from, uh, from Germany. Are you placing lumbar drainage for patient performing uh, uh, craniectomies? No, this is not the standard uh, because uh, uh, during the craniectomy, we have a, a large uh, leakage and then the reconstruction with water tie is enough. We never put lumbar drainage routinely. In the post-op, uh, we do perform CT scan in, uh, in uh, the day after the surgery uh, for understanding the amount of the new encephalus. And if we have some doubt of very slight leakage and there is no uh, growing pneumoencephalus, we can put the lumbar drainage for five days. So thank you so much, uh, Professor, for attending uh, this uh, finale of Stajon, and uh, I'm very glad to have you here. Um, it's always uh, a pleasure to assist to one of your talk. And uh, I um, once again insist to all uh, the participants to attend uh, every courses uh, about uh, dissection courses uh, in Varese, which are very, very interesting. And uh, the faculty and the tutor are brilliant. I've been in there uh, for quite a lot. And uh, uh, since uh, I think that... Uh, the first moment I've decided to build the association was uh, under his auspices. I've and I requested him when I was uh, finishing my specialization, and after five years, uh, I'm glad to, that uh, the association as a son reached to his point. Uh, I would announce uh, the third segment, uh, which is going to start the uh, 15th of January. Uh, I, I will uh, publish today uh, the schedule, and uh, we will start for the 15th of January with uh, a talk about empty nose syndrome that we will go ahead for affection and neurodegenerative diseases. We will have uh, ERS Junior panel. We will have Richard Arby from Australia, Paolo Bat tell you once again from Varese. We have uh, Sergei Karpyshenko from Russia, Christopher Gargalas from Greece, Zara Patel from US, an American Rhinologic Society collaboration will start with a, um, with a panel from them, then uh, Jay Anderson Eloy from the US, and finally Diliana Vicheva from Bulgaria, which uh, will talk about cystic fibrosis. Uh, Today at 3 p.m. we will announce uh, the leaflet. Thank you, Maestro, for attending with us. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have you uh, in, in any talk. Thank you so much. It was a, a great pleasure for me to join you. And uh, I give you whole uh, Merry Christmas. Thank you all. See you on 15th of January. Okay, bye.